to tie together some of the threads from previous lectures, we're going to talk about neuromuscular junctions, how they form and function. Okay, so first a little context. In, in most animals, motor neurons are somewhere in a central nervous system of some sort. In uh, vertebrate embryos, motor neurons are typically born in some portion of the neural tube and they extend axons out from the neural tube along pathways toward, let's say, a target muscle where there might be a bunch of muscle cells, each of which needs to make a synapse with a motor neuron in order to be functional. So axons might grow along defined pathways through the embryo as they do the axon is led by a growth cone that's what that little thing there is supposed to be it's seeking a route toward a target as it happens each muscle cell that, each, that is each cell within a muscle, which consists in the case of a large muscle of very many individual muscle cells, <clears throat> each one of which gets a synapse from one and only one motor neuron. Now, each motor neuron might innervate, might make a synapse with multiple muscle cells. Motor neurons uh, grow out in excess, in vertebrates at least, make connections to many uh, cells, and then they compete to stabilize those connections. Some of them will be pruned back. At any rate, we're gonna take a look first at this growth cone and talk about how it crawls and steers toward a target. Okay, one <clears throat> difference between the growth cone and any other crawling cell, of course, is that the growth cone isn't exactly taking up the rear. It's trailing behind this axon, which is supported ultimately by a bundle of microtubules and a great deal of traffic along them. There are some other cytoskeletal elements of interest in there. This portion here, is also called the neurite. The growth cone consists typically of some philopodia exploring between them some lamellipodial domains. Philopodia, of course, are supported by bundles of actin filaments. And the lamellipodial zones, in turn, correspond to domains of branched actin assembly, dendritic actin assembly. They are populated by a dense dendritic actin network whose continual assembly exerts pressure on the leading edge, protruding it further. Now the motility of growth cones is perhaps best understood in the sea slug aplesia from which one can harvest very large cells that will make uh, correspondingly large growth cones that ha will happily grow across uh, glass dishes uh, with relatively few specific uh, cues. Uh, in particular, this model system was pioneered by a fellow Paul Forscher 
and remains uh, kind of the canonical model for the actin dependent motility of growth cones and their guidance. Now, we talked previously about sort of a hypothetical crawling cell in which the assembly of the dendritic actin network is sufficient through the Brownian ratchet type mechanism to protrude the leading edge forward, making new attachments if it can, and then picking those up at the rear so that the thing rolls along like a tank tread. Now, Aplesia's growth cones clearly add a few other elements to it. Now, first of all, these filipodial bundles extend far back into the into the growth cone toward this so-called transition zone where the microtubules meet uh, arcs of actin filaments sewn together with those uh, filipodial bundles and also sewn together with this dendritic network. Within this transition zone, myosin is actively contracting actin bundles and disassembly is taking place. And in fact, there is a relationship between a, a positive relationship between the rate of disassembly and the rate of myosin driven contraction as shown in the series of papers from Paul Forscher's lab. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, these filopodia, the, these are a, sort of an exploratory type of filopodium, they all have relatively uniform polarity, sort of like an acrosomal process growing out from the growth zone. Although I mentioned previously, some filopodia are long, have mixed polarity, and can actually contract along their length. These have uniform polarity barbed ends out, and they don't contract. However, myosins engage with these filopodial bundles and pull on them. That is, myosins might engage, and since the barbed ends are out, myosins can walk toward the barbed ends, thus pulling the filopodial bundles backwards, such that a uh, filopodium once formed is basically experiencing a, a rearward, that is a tractoring force, which also of course pulls the cell forward, pulls the growth cone forward. In fact, what uh, Paul Forscher characterized very thoroughly is that the entire actin network in here exhibits retrograde flow. As you film these cells, all of the actin in here is flowing backwards, getting contracted together and recycled in this transition zone. So again, a growth cone is a little bit like a crawling mesenchymal cell, except that it leaves behind this uh, microtubule bundle and developing axon instead of pulling the rear of the cell along. Uh, <clears throat> delivery along the neurite has to have to sustain active growth right uh, we're not going to just stretch the whole thing out forever and directed motility here means maintaining a gradient of protrusion at the leading edge versus contraction which are working uh, mechanically against each other to steer, as in to pathfind, to steer the growth cone, extracellular cues must spatially modulate the behavior, the relative balance of protrusion and contraction around the perimeter of this uh, extending apparatus. For reference, let's take a look at another crawling cell. We're gonna take a look at a paradigm in neutrophils. These are cells of our, uh, they're the subset of the white blood cells in our uh, immune system that uh, do cleanup jobs. And um, I'm gonna first mention 
one of the key signaling pathways here. That's rho, remember, which upon activation inserts in the membrane and promotes actin filament assembly through formins. And also through this kinase, rho kinase, or rock, promotes myosin contractility. Rho is one member of a family, so this is rho itself. And neutrophil motility, uh, the other principal participant of interest is the rho family member RAC, which works very similarly in this respect to rho except that RAC interfaces with the ARP2-3 complex to stimulate dendritic actin uh, network formation. Furthermore, through another kinase, happens to be called PAC, RAC inhibits myosin contractility. And through indirect means, RAC and Rho inhibit each other's activity in this context. So we're gonna install this uh, little circuit inside a neutrophil with the addition that a signal, a chemotactic signal, is going to promote activation of both rack and rho. Now in neutrophils, this chemotactic signal might come from, say, a bacterial cell. Neutrophils' job is to go and gobble up the bacterial cell that's uh, infecting your tissues. It shouldn't be there, right? Uh, now the key thing is going to turn out to be that this chemotactic signal, this branch of the signaling pathway, has a short lifetime. Whereas this branch of the pathway has a longer lifetime. So let's install this into a, some sort of blob of a cell here. So here's a neutrophil. It's got a nucleus in there somewhere. And there's a bacterium. The bacterium has a smell to it. Some sort of thing that it exudes. Molecules are coming off of it. And of course the neutrophil is wired up to detect these things. It has some sort of a cell surface receptor on it that detects the O de bacterium as it diffuses around, making a little cloud of bacterial smell. So it's got receptors, one presumes, everywhere on its surface. That's enough of those, right? And these receptors might be activated locally Okay, so this one nearest the source of chemoattractant 
is perhaps activated, this promotes by one pathway activation of RAC. So let's put that into the membrane, whereas here's the inactive RAC. Recall, this is a short lifetime signal. This is the short branch, and hence, perhaps it doesn't diffuse very far through the cell. That is, activation of RAC might be uh, only <clears throat> uh, restricted to a domain near this activated receptor, where in turn, it can stimulate the formation of branched actin. Whereas this other branch of the pathway, which is longer lived, leads to rho. Let's, um, let me bring that down a little further here. So here's my icons for rho. This longer lifetime branch can activate rho activity throughout the cell. But recall, we're going to say that for some reason, as it happens, uh, rho activity, let's say it promotes uh, RAC inactivation, whereas for whatever reason, uh, RAC activity inhibits row activation. These are indirect routes. Some of the pathways in uh, some of the uh, details of these pathways by which these two interfere with each other's activity involve the specific GEFs and GAPs that uh, regulate these GTPases in a particular cell type. At any rate, Row activity, recall, stimulates myosin recruitment and contraction, whereas RAC is stimulating dendritic network assembly and further protrusion. Now, this is the bacterium at time T0, right? And uh, this smell of the bacterium activating a receptor locally establishes a gradient between protrusive activity versus contraction. If the bacterium moves at time whatever, then the source of its smell moves to perhaps activating this receptor. This receptor would cease to be activated. This short lifetime signal would disappear rapidly. And then protrusion would be enhanced over here Contraction would still be enhanced in the rear of the cell, so the gradient is going to swing, and this allows a cell like a neutrophil to follow a moving target. In a similar way, growth cones follow extracellular guidance cues. They're not following signals from bacteria, say. Uh, growth cones are typically following uh, repulsive or attractive cues laid down within the tissues through which they, they migrate, marked out for them by the pattern formation processes of development about which we'll say essentially nothing. And of course, a growth cone has to recognize when it's got to the right target. Now, a very similar thing, this gradient of protrusion and contraction is going on here. One of the uh, key um, results, again, coming from papers by Paul Forscher, if you add cytochalasin or other actin poisons, actually, I'm pretty sure cytochalasin has a, has a sort of a unique property that makes this 
particular experiment um, especially uh, <clears throat> interpretable, cytochalasin caps the barbed ends of filaments. It's not like it just chops them up or something when you add this drug, although perhaps it might lead ultimately to actin network disassembly. The immediate effect of cytochalasin is to cap the barbed end of actin filaments so that they cease to extend further. So what you see is a retrograde flow continues. At least for some time. And this entire network of stuff retreats from the leading edge, leaving a bear zone, leaving a gap ultimately, leaving an empty growth cone as it goes on. On the other hand, if you inhibit, add drugs that inhibit myosin contraction, retrograde, excuse me, retrograde flow doesn't entirely stop because some of it is indeed driven by the Brownian ratchet mechanism by actin polymerization pushing uh, against the barrier of the membrane. So retrograde flow slows. This network is no longer being drawn back by contraction as rapidly. What else happens? Well, think for five seconds, what's gonna happen if actin polymerization continues, but it's no longer being drawn back, of course, there's going to be an abrupt protrusion This is transient. It's a good idea to think about why this is a transient response in this context. Both this lamellipodial zone and the filopodia extend in a few minutes after inhibition of myosin, but uh, let's return to that in question time if uh, nobody uh, immediately thinks of the answer. Why is this a transient response? At any rate, experiments like these demonstrate that this growth cone is under dynamic tension between protrusion and contraction. The contraction is pulling the network, uh, is tensioning the network, pulling it backward and uh, recycling it as protrusion advances it presumably uh, rectified by new contact formation, many of the guidance cues that growth cones follow work either by pro providing some sort of preferred substrate for them to uh, crawl across, that is, things that make good attachments across the membrane between the actin network in here and the substrate across which they crawl, or they work by repulsive cues. And to draw the parallel to neutrophils, I want to um, emphasize a particular class of, of repulsive cue. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one. There are many. Expressed on various cells in tissues are uh, ligands. I don't really know what they look like. I'm going to draw them like this, as if they make a sort of a square-ended hook shape. These ligands called efferins
interact with a cell surface receptor, it must be something that fits that shape. This cell surface receptor, which is called confusingly enough F something or other, it's you know FA4 or whatever. So fill in the blank. The F receptors are tyrosine kinases, and like many such receptors, they dimerize when they bind their ligand, that is when they bind efferin, something happens inside so they, they get phosphorylated and uh, their state changes. And I'm going to draw it as if it's just one big protein, but it's actually a group of several proteins working together inside. When this dimer comes together and activates, they have they're associated with a with a domain, a pro, uh, independent protein as it happens, that is a GEF for rho. Hence, okay, this is supposed to be in a plasma membrane too. When one cell expressing an F, that is expressing this receptor, encounters another cell expressing the efferin, activation of this receptor leads to activation of rho, which of course in turn leads to, uh, among other things, myosin contractility. How does that work for our growth cone? Well, let's, um, I'll diagram it this way as if there's uh, some cells over here. And along comes a growth cone. Wandering this way. And on these cells is expressed each of them is producing on its surface this efferin. Okay, so whichever part of this growth cone encounters these cells expressing the efferin is going to experience locally. Oh, oops, fix that. Is going to experience local activation of rho and consequently increased contractility. and uh, decreased protrusivity. That is, if we imagine mapping something like this neutrophil circuit onto the growth cone, then the signaling through this row-coupled F receptor biases protrusion, it swings the gradient of protrusion versus contraction around so that it now points that way instead of this way. By swinging it around, it is directing the growth cone away so that its protrusion will continue over here and perhaps it will retreat from these cells, thus turning this migrating axon away from a particular root and keeping it in its lane. As I said, there are many guidance cues. Uh, this is just one example that happens to couple intuitively
to the same kind of motility pathway that is uh, otherwise understood from, from motile cells like neutrophils. Upon reaching its target, the growth cone collapses, microtubules invade, and synapse formation begins. Synapse formation includes adhesion and a specialized extracellular matrix. Recruitment of synaptic vesicles and the initiation of electrical activity in the neuron. And for any, for any synapse, of course, of course, there's something that has to go on postsynaptically as well. That is, the target is also going to change. In the case of a muscle cell, the neuron secretes a protein called agrin that induces clustering of the neurotransmitter receptor. The neurotransmitter in this case is acetylcholine. And its receptor is expressed on the muscle cells and clusters around synapses into patches. Now, uh, I want to mention in passing, <clears throat> this process, the formation of the neuromuscular junction and its operation uh, are, again, uh, originally understood in a marine organism. In this case, the electric ray torpedo, not named after the thing that submarines fire at ships. It's the other way around. Uh, torpedo, the electric ray, has this massive set of uh, what once were muscle cells that have become converted into a battery and it can deliver enough of electric shock that it makes you torpid, hence torpedo. Apparently they were once prescribed as a headache remedy in uh, Roman times. Lie upon one of these rays, I guess, and it'll cure your headaches. Anyway, uh, torpedo's electric organ consists of a set of of muscle cells that have lost all their contractile bundles, but they retain all the rest of the physiology. It happens that they have about a thousand times the density of acetylcholine receptors as say vertebrate muscle. Uh, and so uh, first of all, it's one of the first places that people were able to purify a neurotransmitter receptor and study its function. It's where this molecule, agrin, was originally purified. And as it happens, a similar electric fish, the electric eel, was the original source for the first purified and uh, therefore studyable uh, voltage active, act, excuse me, voltage activated sodium channel, which is so essential to the action potential. So we have torpedoes electric organ to thank for what we know about the formation and function of the neuromuscular junction. This diagram, the newly formed synapse here. Of course, it's gonna have some synaptic vesicles I've got to leave a gap for the action here. And it interfaces with a muscle cell. The postsynaptic membrane might undergo significant remodeling. Concentrating receptors there. Recall, first of all, step one here is the action potential which travels down the axon.
rapidly. And when it arrives at the synaptic terminal, voltage sensitive calcium channels open and allow calcium to go into the presynaptic terminal, which induces neurotransmitter vesicles to fuse. So these uh, vesicles fuse, dump their contents into the uh, synaptic cleft, So that's step two here is calcium influx. And step three is transmitter release. Recall that Sodium is high out here, whereas potassium is low. And it's the opposite inside the cell. For a muscle, just as much as for an egg or a nerve. This condition is sustained primarily by the sodium-potassium exchanging ATPase which consumes most of the ATP that you produce. It's pumping sodium out in exchange for potassium that goes in, but then there's a leak. There's a leak current that lets potassium flow down its electric, uh, excuse me, down its concentration gradient and that leaves behind negative charge inside the cell, giving rise to a membrane voltage. When the flow of potassium to the outside creates a sufficient membrane voltage to oppose further uh, efflux of positive ions from the cell, uh, this process comes to a steady state. <clears throat> well, you know what happens next. Here's the acetylcholine receptor embedded in the membrane. That is a five subunit channel whose action is gated by acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes some of these five subunits to swing a little bit to open up a pore which admits sodium. In fact, it'll let other ions through too, but sodium is the, uh, the principal actor here, admits sodium ions. So that's step four. The acetylcholine receptor opens in response to neurotransmitter, lets a little sodium in, partially depolarizing the membrane. Then the next step, number five, the membrane is full of voltage sensitive channels. And in response to a sufficient partial depolarization, step five is that these voltage sensitive sodium channels open initiating the action pot potential, depolarizing the muscle cell membrane and, uh, and triggering what? Okay, so step six is depolarization. 
of course, ultimately it triggers muscle contraction. Uh, depolarization does so by triggering calcium influx. through, again, voltage sensitive calcium channels in the muscle cell membrane. Let's take a look in a little more detail now at how that works. I'm going to stick to just a few of these parts here and not draw everything in. The idea here is this is the myofibril, that is the contractile apparatus within the muscle cell. I'm not trying to draw anything to scale here I'm, uh, or the appropriate numbers or, or the details. Here we have, again, the synapse and the muscle cell membrane, which experiences an action potential is greatly elaborated into so-called T-tubules because they're kind of T-shaped, which take the action potential, conducting it like wires deep into the cytoplasm. The T-tubules wrap amongst membranes of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is an extension of the endomembrane system, which behaves as the calcium sequestering compartment, and it wraps the myofibril. I'm not drawing it all the way along, but imagine this holy jacket of endomembrane sacs wrapping up the contractile apparatus inside the muscle cell. These are quite close together, and as the action potential is conducted into the interior of the cell, the depolarization induces calcium influx that is, that way, through channels in the cell membrane. And in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, step seven, is calcium-induced calcium release turns a uh, small calcium influx in, re in re direct response to the action potential into a great big bath of calcium that bathes the contractile apparatus in the myofibril. What's the point of that? Well, let's recall briefly what's inside the myofibril. We'll just draw a little section. These are supposed to be Z disks, and I'm just going to draw two of the thin filaments extending from each and then a thick filament between them. And these myosin heads in a resting muscle are not engaged with actin. Because the thin filaments are wrapped in this protein, tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is a long protein. It's not as if one protein spans the entire thin filament. There are several uh, successive little snakes lying on each of the thin filaments, and they are in the way so that myosin cannot engage with actin filaments. Extend those just a little bit so all those heads can reach. So the green things, recall from a previous lecture, those are tropomyosin, 
And these brown little dots that I'm drawing on there, sitting on the tropomyosins in turn, this is a little complex of proteins, troponins. So the brown dots are the troponins. And one of the troponins is a calcium binding protein. It's kind of like a muscle specific version of centering or uh, calmodulin. What calcium influx does, step eight, is the calcium troponin interaction moves tropomyosin out of the way. Now, as it happens, it, it's a little bit hard to diagram, uh, diagram that, but uh, if I remember correctly, what really happens is that the troponin complex is holding tropomyosin in the absence of calcium, it's holding tropo tropomyosin in such a way that uh, it overlaps a myosin binding site. And when calcium comes along, if I remember correctly, tropomyosin sort of slides into a preferred position and um, gets out of the way that way. So now these myosin heads engage with actin, pull on it, and contract the sarcomere. Again, there are hundreds of heads in each of these thick filament bundles, each of these myosin bundles. Let's uh, put the tropomyosins in there now safely out of the way. Having been yanked off of their filaments. One final detail, this myosin in muscle, which does this, is not the same as the myosin that we talk about when we're talking about, uh, say, crawling cells or something like that. The myosin in non-muscle non cells has a relatively high duty ratio. That is, it spends a relatively long time bound to actin as it goes through contraction. The myosin, too, that is uh, deployed in skeletal muscle has a very short duty ratio. It spends a very short time bound to an actin filament as it takes its power stroke. And that matters because these very many heads <clears throat> engage with actin very transiently to ratchet it along to mediate contraction. Each of the different kinds of myosin deployed in skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and in non-muscle cells has distinct properties, distinct propensities to assemble into oligomers of greater or lesser size, distinct duty ratios, and distinct regulatory properties, even though they are very similar proteins in their basic outlines.